I was working for an architect in Melrose when I decided <clears throat> I was going to start my own business. And one day I, I went home from my employer after having resigned and I got a call from the Archdiocese of Boston, Monsignor Francis Sexton, who said, we would like to give you a new project to start your business off. And it became St. Athanasius Church in Reading. One of the comments that I hear that gratifies me most is when someone who's never been to the church tells me it's so beautiful. When they walked in, they, they saw such a beautiful church. And I tell them, yeah. And I bet when you're outside in the parking lot and you saw the outside for the first time, you had no idea what to expect because it's such a unique shape. Every once in a while, I would drive down uh, Haverhill Street and I would look at the construction that was going on there and I couldn't believe what was going on. I looked at a roof that I had never seen before and I was wondering how in the world it was going to stay up in the air. I remember a woman driving by and saw this shape of the roof and we had just had a hurricane and she pulled us, pulled off to the road, side of the road, came up to me and said, oh my God, did the hurricane do this? It is one of two suspended roofs like that in all of North America. So we really are sort of an engineering feat. It was a hyperbolic paraboloid, uh, a thin shell concrete roof structure, three inches thick. The hyperbolic paraboloid is a complex curve as the name suggests. It's extraordinarily durable structurally. For a three inch thick concrete slab to span 155 feet is extraordinary. We moved here in 1958, a couple of years before the church was built. And I recall the day that they poured the roof of the church with the concrete trucks were lined up on Haverhill Street all day long, many, many of them. A continuous pour one day. I designed all the furnishings as well, and I designed a crucifix that hung over the altar that was about three times life size, so that the, the crucifix was a major feature of the church, and the body of Christ that was demonstrated was about 18 feet tall. That the crucifix up there and that cross is what, what an exclamation point! It really, truly is an exclamation point on what what it is to be a Catholic and what we believe in. That's what we believe in, and that's what draws you. This whole this whole lines of these church draw you to what is the most important thing, and that's the consecration. That's the mass. That's that's it. We knew that the architecture was done with intent, with purpose. Once we learned about it, it just served to, to further inform and infuse the liturgy with additional meaning. You know, St. Athanasius was very important in, in terms of the doctrine of the Trinity yes. and this, you know, symbols and designs of triangles throughout the whole, uh, you know, throughout the whole architecture of the church. It really had meaning to the, to the building and God's presence uh, here with us. St. Athanasius was a defender of the Trinity and the whole idea of the three persons in one God. And the architect used that in the building of the church. Um, if you look around the inside, you see a lot of use of the triangle, which is the symbol of the Trinity. And even in the altar, the back altar, 
underneath the crucifix there's the, the Alpha is at the top and then underneath the Ark for the Omega. And in some of the stained glass you see uses of the triangle symbol. And even the, the roof, the way it's pointed, it sort of is two triangles. Um, so the architect really tried to um, bring St. Athanasius, the person, into the structure. It was a great project, uh, a lot of hard work, but also a great deal of enjoyment. Cardinal Cushing, who dedicated the church, a nice fellow, but very impatient, he walked around and blessed the church, and of course, I was in the background against the wall near the front, and he went around uh, blessing the church with the holy water and so forth. And in the process, he stepped on my foot. So from a human point of view, uh, I participated. He said something like, get your foot the heck out of the way. <laughs> Uh, something like that. He was a tough guy, but a nice fellow. We had been at St. Agnes, and then when this church was built, you were supposed to go to this church now. The, the town was divided in half, and this was our new parish. So we did. We came, and um, immediately we felt so welcomed. The original pastor, uh, Father Dennis O'Leary, was just um, so welcoming and so warm and just a loving, very loving man. Father O'Leary was wonderful, he was. And I think we all loved him and we were all very much part of the church. You know, you felt that you belonged, <laughs> really. My parents threw themselves into the parish, you know, with both feet. Uh, my father joined every committee that, that was available. My mother was a member of the choir. We came to the first mass that was held, first mass that was held here in the church. And uh, we walked in and I couldn't believe the beauty of the church. It was amazing. We came in, we took a pew, the same pew that I still go to every single Sunday. It's in the back on the right hand side of the church. And it was the second pew on the left and no one dared sit there because that was our pew. And behind us, growing up, was Deacon Matt and his family. It was almost like it was assigned. We all had our place to sit. And we would watch the girls misbehave and get pinched by their father or their mother. And then we would get pinched for enjoying the fact that they got pinched. But that was every Sunday, we were right behind the, the Rickley girls. My father uh, became a lector and uh, later on went on to do the training and uh, the scheduling for the lectors for years and years. And he had a beautiful voice and he had a wonderful cadence. And as I listened to him, I said, I want to be like Tony Rickley. I want to read like him. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. And sadly, in, in 1968, uh, Father O'Leary passed away. And then we were very fortunate to have uh, Father Russ Collins. He was actually a Monsignor, but you didn't call him Monsignor. He was Father Collins. Didn't want to be called Monsignor. He was a teacher, and when he came here, he continued teaching. His homilies were always so educational. I remember that, that sort of that grandfatherly feel that he gave to everybody that came through the door. He made this parish what it was, that, that sort of family feel to it. And I remember the summer camps when I was in fourth, fifth grade. We would be spread out all over the lawn. Summer camps, Father Collins would come by with the popsicles, Sister Joan with her guitar. <laughs> The 70s was the folk music. Four o'clock mass was the folk mass. And that was what everybody was doing at the time. And then we started uh, family ministry. And um, we were, my husband and I were a part of that. And they did outreach in different homes. One Christmas Eve, I do remember even being part of a, um, almost a theatrical performance 
on the altar, all, all of those sorts of things, with Father Collins. So he was very open to that sort of 70s kind of movement in the church, if you will. Then Father Collins celebrated his 50th anniversary as a priest, and then he retired. And Father Frank came in, and we were like, oh, how's this gonna be? And Father Frank was just as wonderful. He was, again, that sort of grandfatherly kind of figure. He married Dino and I. Soon after, we built our house here in Reading, and we came back to Mary Ann's church. And our daughter was born probably a year and a half later, and immediately Father Frank O'Hare got us involved in the, in the community by inviting us to be part of the um, baptism prep. Talk to the families, why, you know, why do you want to baptize your child in the Catholic Church? You give a witness talk of what it meant to you. Then, soon thereafter, we were invited to be part of the pre cana group. That's right and we'd alternate uh, sites with St. Agnes. So one, one year we'd do it here, one year we'd do it there, but it was, we brought the two um, parishes together. We've been very fortunate. We've had some very, very meaningful pastors and, and associates over the years. And, uh, I think they helped the church to grow a lot and, and, the, and the people in the church to feel part of a family. Both of our children went to this parish for their whole lives and our son was the first to be baptized and this was when the church actually had the um, tub. <laughs> The baptismal font. It had a baptismal font, yes. but it, it looked a like a jacuzzi. Yes, a and jacuzzi. Um, that's since been gone. But it was wonderful. I mean, the the priest was very enthusiastic, and mm -hmm. Luke got pretty wet. Um, and that was in two thousand. He, he, yeah. was, he was only. Uh, he was very small. He was only a month three, old. Three weeks, month yeah. old. Yeah. Father Kremel, Father Bill was here. He was just prior to, to Father Darren. He was given a homily and it was a little bit on the long side. So he stopped and he said, does anybody here think I ought to stop? And there was a young boy, like eight or nine years old, went, yeah, right down the house, right down the house. Russo transformed what was somewhat of a parish that just was existing into a parish that has come to life between the renovations, the, the people that have come back to the church, the younger families, younger families coming back. I think we moved into the area about four or five years ago, and um, at that time we were looking for you know a church to go to. One day it was around Easter time when we came here, and um, we really liked how they celebrated the Easter Triduum. The, the mass ever since then we've you know been part of the community when father Caloroso came in he had a vision essentially what he was doing he was getting it back to what it used to be like for instance the tabernacle used to be off to the side but now it's it's where it originally was when it was designed. We had the Marian Shrine put in as well. It used yeah. to be a confessional in the old days, and it was just a storage cabinet or something like that for a long time. And, yeah. and so we put that in. It's lovely over there. So it's really, you know, things going back to the way they used to be, but also huge improvements with the, uh, the wood. Though you may see the beauty of the interior of the church, once you understand why the exterior is the way it is, you see the beauty in that as well. The same occurs for the parish community, because not only do you come in and see a beautiful church, you also see reverent worship, and you see a community of people who live the gospel, who are in great community with one another, and a great spirit of welcome. This church is so full of the Holy Spirit. This was 
the first place I learned that there was a Holy Spirit. Even though you say it, your nightly prayer, you don't really get it. And the Spirit is apparent in all the people here, the community. The pastors, the priests, the associates, the, the people that have worked in the office, and our fellow worshipers in the pews around us. really feel like you're among friends, not just fellow parishioners. Everyone is cordial to one another. Everyone is caring for one another. We've developed such close friendships right from the parish pews, uh, you know, from, from saying hello at the beginning of Mass to the sign of peace to after Mass, people wanting to chat. There are people that I see on the softball field that I also mm -hmm. see at church. That's right. And it's heartening to, to see them. All there is is community. That's the root of what the Catholic Church is. We are one body. And it is very, very evident in this community that we are one body. Everybody is looking out for everybody else. We quickly became involved in this parish. You can't help not become involved. It's that type of magnetism here. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ under I often will canter at the four o'clock mass. I love doing it. I would, I'm happy to do it every week if I possibly can. I was a confirmation uh, teacher, and then I was a confirmation advisor. In recent years, I belonged to the funeral choir, <laughs> which we laugh about the name, the funeral choir, but that's what we did. We sang at all the funerals that were at church. I've got about the 50 years that I've been I'm not sure. I've seen people who were here before come and go. What's really uh, changed for us as our children have grown up a little bit is that we have a little bit more time for us, mm. and, and it kind of coincided with when we got involved with the with the annual Christmas fair, and just getting to know the wonderful people that have been part of the fair for many years, and you know, kind of the multiple generations oh, that yeah. are involved. You drive by and the parish looks alive. It looks, it looks inviting. I think I want to see what that's all about. The more that you're involved in the church, the more people that you know and the variety of people that you know, yeah. from, from older, seasoned, you know, parishioners to the, the younger folk as well. I think we were looking for a community where we felt welcomed that also, we weren't the only young adults in the community. It was refreshing to come to a parish that had multiple families with kids our age. Some of our best friends right now, they, um, they go to the church. We have them over quite a bit. And... Yeah, our kids are all friends and um, they've really grown up together. <laughs> Our collaborative parishes of St. Agnes and St. Athanasius share a vibrant history of over a hundred years serving the community of Reading, Massachusetts. Well, at some point in our life, to become the image and likeness of this man. The experiences that uh, we've I've had here has, has, has changed my life. This is part of who I am and who my family is, and it has been for as long as I can remember. <laughs>